Hey friends, let me share a little story with you. You know, there was a time when I found myself in kind of a bind, just like many of us do from time to time. And Dave, the sponsor of today's video, would have been so useful when I got slapped with a parking ticket and didn't have any wiggle room in my budget. Man, that unexpected expense hit me like a ton of bricks at the time, but there's a solution that can help you in those pinch moments. It's called Dave. Dave is the banking app that's leveling up the financial playing field. When you download Dave, you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less. And here's the best part. No credit checks, no late fees. With Dave's extra cash account, you can advance the money you need with no interest and then settle up later. Whether it's more money to buy groceries, fill up the tank, or pay the rent, Dave's got your back without making you wait for your next paycheck. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to make their finances easier. In fact, Dave has helped its members avoid over $2.5 billion in overdraft fees since 2017. So, if you ever find yourself in a financial pinch, don't stress out. Get the help that you need by downloading Dave. Download Dave today at dave.com slash let's read. That's dave.com slash let's read. And you can get up to $500 in five minutes or less when you download Dave. No credit check, no late fees. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve, member FDIC. Fear in death. My powers continue. In August of 2014, a 58-year-old man from southern Florida sat down at his computer and opened a very special kind of web browser. Using a software known as Tor, the man was not only able to browse what's known as the surface net completely anonymously, but it also granted him access to the secret labyrinthine substructure commonly referred to as the dark web. Once cloaked in his digital shroud, the man began the lengthy process of uploading all the necessary files to create his very own website. But unlike many others who sought to exploit the anonymity of the dark web to profit from cybercrime or illicit marketplaces, the 58-year-old Floridian had something very different in mind. His website would be named The Playpen, and his goal was to catalog the largest collection of child exploitation material in history. And just a few months later, the playpen came to the attention of the FBI as a result of Operation Pacifier, one of the largest global anti-child exploitation efforts in law enforcement history. The Bureau claimed that they were aware of the site's existence from the day of its creation, but were unable to act until they'd accurately tracked the location of the site's servers, and thus its owner and operator. The discovery came following a tip from Interpol, the international law enforcement entity that facilitates worldwide police cooperation and crime control. Agents from over in Europe had themselves received a tip from a member of the public, who claimed to have made a chilling discovery whilst casually surfing the internet. After attempting to directly enter the IP address of another computer, the tipster must have entered a wrong number because, a split second after pressing the computer's enter key, they were faced with a truly harrowing sight. There, in full view of any average Joe's surface net user, was a huge collection of child exploitation material, all under the banner of a website called The Playpen. Finally, in February of 2015, FBI agents managed to track the servers to a home in Naples, Florida, and following a decisive dawn raid, the 58-year-old Floridian was identified as Stephen W. Chase. Upon realizing that he faced life in a federal prison's protective custody unit, Stephen promised to fully cooperate with his FBI captors, and when prompted, he gave them full and unfettered access to his devices and hard drives. The FBI spent weeks mining data from the drive containing the website's backup data, and Stephen Chase's computer was a goldmine of information concerning the identity and whereabouts of his fellow degenerates. But once they were done, the FBI didn't close the playpen down as one might expect them to. Instead, they kept it running. Between February 19th and March 4th of 2015, the sole operators of one of the most active dark web child exploitation forums was none other 
than the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Unnamed agents did their best to maintain the ruse that Chase was still in charge of the site, striving to mimic his typing style and vocabulary so that the website's users believed it was business as usual. During those two weeks, the website's user base was said to have grown by more than 30%, as people from all over the dark web flocked to yet another burgeoning collection of stomach-churning depravity. But all the while, FBI cybercrime specialists employed a malware-based network investigative technique to hack into the computers of those who visited the site, which in turn revealed sensitive personal information that could be used to track and arrest them. By the time they finally closed the website down, and in tandem with a plethora of international policing agencies, the FBI had secured the arrest of almost a thousand individuals from around the globe. Five of those arrests led to almost instantaneous convictions for a number of high-ranking site users, putting a huge dent in the trade of child exploitation content worldwide. When the news broke that such a huge number of child abusers had been apprehended as a result of Operation Pacifier, it was met with celebration by the wider general public. However, as more and more details began to emerge, and journalists leaked the fact that the FBI had continued the website's operation following the arrest of its owner, there was widespread public outrage. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, who promote online civil liberties, heavily criticized the FBI for committing the very crime it was charged with putting a stop to. Others claimed that there was evidence that the FBI not only operated the site, but significantly improved its speed, navigation, and accessibility. The FBI defended this decision, claiming that everything they did was in aid of their overall mission, and reminded critics that the operation had bagged almost a thousand dangerous individuals, as well as promoting the rescue of hundreds of abused children from all four corners of the globe. However, in one case, their brazen technique meant that one of the very same predators they sought to apprehend got to walk free with no charges whatsoever. The initial search warrants secured by FBI agents restricted them to gather information from only the Eastern District of Virginia, but little did the agents know their malware-based data mining application was designed with the sole purpose of indiscriminately siphoning data from every single user who visited the site. That meant that when it became evident that this was the case, at least one suspected individual was released without charge after the search warrant was declared invalid in this particular case. To some, this might seem like an easy mistake to make. A cut corner here, a miscommunication there. Things just naturally go wrong sometimes. But skirting the restrictions of a federal warrant is an extremely serious breach of judicial procedure, something a small town sheriff's deputy knows damned well not to do. Therefore, it really does beg the question, why would an experienced FBI agent do something that would obviously undermine such an important investigation? Assistant Federal Defender Peter Adolph claimed that he had evidence that the playpen distributed 200 videos, 9,000 images, and 13,000 links to illicit images of children while the FBI oversaw the site. Adolph backed up his bold claims with archived messages from playpen users who frequently commented on how well the site was running during the FBI's secretive tenure. In 2019, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit weighed in on whether the FBI should have operated the Playpen website in its United States v. Anzalone opinion. It argued that operating such a despicable website for two weeks amounted to outrageous government conduct that violated due process. The court also argued, in operating the Playpen, the FBI had distributed this material to hundreds of thousands of individuals, and in doing so, had absolutely no control over how these images would be used forthwith. While the court said the government's conduct borders on outrageous, it refused to dismiss the charges. Ideally, they said the FBI should not have run a child exploitation website for any length of time, but that at the same time, and I'm using their words here, we do not live in an ideal world. Recognizing that another website would just pop up in 24 hours, the FBI decided to run the website, deciding that the rewards far outweighed any risk. It's entirely true that running the playpen led to the arrest and conviction, as well as the rescue of hundreds of exploited children from around the globe. But the question remains, at what point 
do the ends stop justifying the means? In the year 2009, Gilberto Valle was a 25-year-old police officer living with his elderly father in the New York City borough of Queens. As you can imagine, law enforcement is an extremely demanding profession, and it gave Gilberto very little time to do anything else. After grueling 14-hour shifts, all he wanted to do when he clocked off was collapse into bed and sleep like the dead. Then on his off days, he found himself far too exhausted to socialize, and this left Gilberto in something of a predicament. He longed for a romantic partner, but simply didn't have the time to look for one in person, so instead, he put his faith into the online dating website OkCupid. This is how Gilberto met Kathleen Mangan, an elementary school teacher who'd recently settled in East Harlem. They hit it off fairly quickly, and after just a few months of dating, they moved into a small one-bedroom apartment together near 88th Street and 3rd Avenue. It was nice at first, Kathleen later recalled. We laughed a lot, he was a gentleman, but things changed after I got pregnant. After breaking the news to him, Kathleen expected Gilberto to be happy. Instead, he seemed horrified. He kept saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, Kathleen later explained. But after he calmed down, he called my parents and assured them that he'd do the right thing. The apparent change of heart was a huge relief, but Gilberto's newfound fatherly enthusiasm was disappointingly short-lived. He drifted away from me, so slowly I almost didn't notice, Kathleen said. Then one day, he just didn't seem interested anymore. Many blamed Gilberto's behavior on the stresses of being a new parent, and he seemed to prove his detractors wrong when, after moving his nascent family into a larger two-bedroom apartment in Forest Hills, he asked Kathleen to marry him. Their wedding was held on June 19th of 2012, with their nine-month-old daughter Josephine being the unofficial guest of honor. Making things official seemed to renew Gilberto's fatherly instincts, at least temporarily, but he soon sank back into the same patterns of disinterest and sorely neglected his wife and daughter. He rarely helped with the baby, Kathleen recalled. Then, when he came home from the precinct after midnight, he'd stay up till four, five, sometimes six in the morning, playing video games or browsing the internet. As far as she knew, Gilberto spent most of his time online browsing sports and policing forums, but one day, during the summer of 2012, Kathleen walked in on him doing something else. Having worked as a teacher for the better part of a decade, Kathleen possessed an impressive level of computer literacy. This meant that when she walked into Gilberto's office that day, she recognized what he was doing. And what he was doing was a mass erasure of his internet browser's search history. Upon hearing her enter the room, Gilberto quickly minimized the browser window and pretended to have been doing something else. But Kathleen had noticed and she found herself gripped by a nail-biting curiosity. A few days later, and following Gilberto's morning departure, Kathleen crept into his office then logged onto his computer. I noticed that there were two little image files at the bottom of the screen, she said, so I opened them. The images depicted an extremely disturbing variety of adult content, yet they also struck Kathleen as horrifyingly different from anything she had a cursory knowledge of. I've read Fifty Shades of Grey. I know what that stuff is, Kathleen said. But this was different, because the girl in the pictures, she was dead. There was a time when a more insecure Kathleen had believed that Gilberto's dispassion stemmed from her lack of attractiveness. Yet following the disturbing discovery on his desktop computer, she realized something was very wrong with her husband. She sent him a text message, one that simply read, We need to talk. Then, when Gilberto returned from his shift that evening, he seemed visibly nervous. During the confrontation, Gilberto broke down into tears and claimed that his interest in such deeply disturbing adult content stemmed from his inability to deal with stress. He promised to visit a therapist and swore he'd never visit any such websites ever again. I thought maybe we'd had a breakthrough, Kathleen later said. We were communicating, he was being honest, he was talking to me. But for the rest of that summer, 
I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw. Finally, on September 9th of 2012, Kathleen once again crept into Gilberto's office while he was at work. Only this time, and on the advice of some online cybersecurity experts, it was to install a discreet form of spyware on his computer. I had no choice, she said. I was scared. And she was right to be. The following day, Kathleen used the spyware to find out which websites her husband had recently visited. What she found was nothing short of horrifying. The names of the websites were chilling, but what truly turned Kathleen's stomach was seeing what her husband had been getting up to. I started going through his instant messages, she said. Then all of a sudden, I'm staring at pictures of myself, pictures of my friends, pictures of other people we knew. Gilberto and his anonymous online friends had been fantasizing about tying Kathleen up, hanging her upside down, then cutting her throat with a razor-sharp knife. They said it would be fun watching the blood gush out of me, she later said. Another person said, if she cries, don't listen to her, don't give her mercy. And all my husband had to say in response was, don't worry, we'll gag her. But that wasn't all. And as Kathleen continued to scroll through Gilberto's messages, she uncovered an appalling escalation of their fantasy. They didn't just want to kill me, she said. They wanted to cook me, and eat me too. Upon realizing that her life might be in danger, Kathleen immediately booked a flight to her parents' place in their home state of Nevada and took baby Josephine with her. Gilberto remained blissfully ignorant of her discovery and continued to browse violent imagery online. He googled things like how to kidnap a woman and best human meat recipes. He also kept a secret folder hidden away among a veneer of innocent-sounding directories in which he kept photographs of the women he'd like to murder and cannibalize. Many were athletes and actresses, but many included his wife's family members, friends, and co-workers. One picture was captioned, I'll be eyeing her from head to toe and licking my lips, longing for the day I cram a chloroform-soaked rag in her face. It was now impossible for Kathleen to discern her husband's sick fantasies from palpable threats to the safety of her loved ones. So, with a heavy heart, she reported Gilberto's activities to the police. Just a few days later, during the early afternoon of October 24th, Gilberto was enjoying a day off in this Forest Hills apartment when suddenly his phone began to ring. Gilberto didn't recognize the number, nor did he recognize the voice on the other end. Uh, is this Gilberto? The stranger asked. It is, the man himself replied. I'm sorry to tell you this, buddy, but I got this number from your insurance company, the stranger explained. Someone's hit your car pretty bad by the looks of things. You're home right now by any chance, are you? Gilberto didn't bother to answer the question. He simply ended the call, then walked outside with a furious urgency about him. Yet when he arrived in the apartment complex's parking lot, he saw that his car hadn't so much as a scratch on it. Confused, Gilberto turned around to walk back inside, but found his path blocked by three sturdy-looking men in suits. Gilberto Valier, one of them called out. It was not a question. They knew it was him. We're from the FBI, and we'd like to ask you a few questions. Following a brief interrogation, Gilberto was placed under arrest. Then shortly afterward, he was charged with conspiracy to kidnap his own wife, Kathleen Mangan. Investigators soon discovered that there was no shortage of evidence and began collating emails which laid out Gilberto's strategies. In many of these emails, Gilberto made it abundantly clear that he was ready and willing to abuse his authority as a police officer to lull potential victims into a false sense of security. This is what made the case all the more disturbing, said one U.S. attorney following Gilberto's arrest. When you consider Valier's position as a New York City police officer and his sworn duty to serve and protect, it makes what he did unforgivable. By the time Gilberto's trial commenced, he had gained worldwide infamy as the cannibal cop of New York City. Yet as the judiciary set about determining his guilt, the court of public opinion was concerned with something else entirely. To the public, it wasn't what Gilberto was being accused of, 
It was what he might do in the future should he either beat the charge or receive a lenient sentence. Never in my career have I ever hesitated to tell the marshals to take the handcuffs off the client when I'm interviewing them one-on-one, -on -one, said the federal attorney who defended Gilberto, and this was the first time in my career I'd ever, for just a second, thought about keeping the handcuffs on. Yet to some, this could be interpreted as a shockingly prejudicial statement. After all, Gilberto wasn't on trial for anything he'd actually done. He was on trial because of something he'd thought about doing. The prosecution sought to paint Gilberto Valle as someone fully committed to living out the fantasies he'd fostered online. But where exactly did he go to indulge such lurid and bloodthirsty thoughts? One of the websites Gilberto visited the most was named The Dark Fetish Network. The FBI estimated that the network was comprised of over 50,000 unique users, and although its homepage bore a disclaimer stating, fantasies only, it was clear that many users practiced their proclivities on and off the internet. Gilberto began visiting the DFN in late 2011 and under the username Girl Meet Hunter, where he garnered sadistic admiration from fellow users on account of his frighteningly vivid fantasies. He partook in explicit exchanges with many of them, but maintained closely and constantly in touch with just three. The first was a 22-year-old mechanic from South Jersey named Mike Van Hees. The second was a British man named Dale Bollinger, who went by the username Moody Blues. And the third was a man named Ali Khan, who split his time between the US, the UK, and his native Pakistan. In January of 2012, Gilberto sent Mike Van Hees a photograph of Alicia Friska, an elementary school teacher and close friend of Kathleen's. The caption simply read, Five grand, and she's yours. Van Hees attempted to haggle Gilberto down to 4,000, to which he replied, I'm putting my neck on the line here. If something goes wrong somehow, I'm done for. 5,000, and you need to make sure that she's not found. She would definitely make the news. During exchanges with Ali Khan, Gilberto suggested taking his wife on a surprise trip to India. There, she would be ambushed, murdered, and then cannibalized by the two men. We'll take turns with her, Gilberto wrote, after sending Ali a photo of Kathleen in a bikini. During his conversation with Ali, Gilberto exhibited a shocking amount of hatred for a woman named Andrea Noble, who was later determined to have been one of his old college friends. It's personal with Andrea, Gilberto wrote. She will absolutely suffer. I'm in the middle of constructing a pulley apparatus in my basement to string her up by her feet. It was never confirmed why Gilberto felt such aminous towards an old friend, but whatever it was, it inspired a murderous grudge in him that lasted more than a decade. By the summer of 2012, Gilberto was heavily engaged with conversations with Dale Bollinger, the British man who went by the username Moody Blues. Bollinger boasted of his ownership of a large industrial oven that had been installed in an isolated cabin nestled among the desolate highlands of northern Scotland. Gilberto showed him numerous pictures of female friends and co-workers before Bollinger settled on a woman named Kimberly Sauer. She's perfect, he said. It must be her. Once she's dead, I'll take her out and properly butcher her body, then cook the meat right away. We could even mount her on a spit like a rotisserie chicken. Gilberto later emailed Bollinger in a Word document entitled, A Blueprint for Abducting and Cooking Kimberly, and listed the materials they needed to murder and cannibalize her without attracting attention to themselves. Gil listed assets and materials such as chloroform, a fully functioning vehicle that would not break down or otherwise cause them trouble, a length of strong rope and a roll of duct tape, a tarp or plastic sheet to contain forensic evidence, and cheap sneakers that they could wear before burning to minimize the amount of forensic evidence available to law enforcement. During the course of their investigation, the FBI discovered that Gilberto had utilized the NYPD's database in order to peruse the files of potential victims. Records showed that from the summer of 2011 to the summer of 2012, Gilberto gained access to the files of three women, Andrea Noble, Kimberly Sauer, and Maureen Hardigan, who was an old high school friend. The files were mostly basic information such as date of birth, eye color, as well as previous convictions. 
However, they also contained information Gill would have found very useful, their home addresses. On July 22nd of 2012, Gilberto told one of his online companions that he'd meet up with Kimberly Sauer during a college reunion down in Maryland. She looked absolutely mouthwatering, he said. I could hardly contain myself. Just over a month later, Gilberto and Bollinger discussed methods by which they could abduct a woman named Christine Ponticelli. Gil and Christine had never met, but since she was a recent graduate from his former high school, he most likely happened across her picture or profile via some kind of social media group for alumni. However, it's worth noting that Gil's attention seemed to have erratically shifted from day to day. Not long after he fantasized over Ponticelli's kidnap and murder, he became almost entirely consumed with the previously mentioned Andrea Noble. I swear, he wrote, if she lived near me, she'd be gone by now. Even if I got caught, it'd be so worth it. Gill seemed primed to act on his psychotic urges, but when the FBI raided his home in October of 2012, there wasn't a single scrap of physical evidence which suggested that he was about to kidnap, kill, or cook someone. And despite frequently boasting of his efforts to brew a batch of homemade chloroform, there were no traces of the chemical storage or its manufacturer at the Forest Hills apartment. At his trial, one of Gilberto's defense attorneys, Edward Zoss, laid out the crux of his legal argument. According to the client's direct messages, three different women were due to be kidnapped on President's Day, he said. That day comes and goes, but nothing happens. Then my client changes the proposed date to Labor Day, but once again, that day comes and goes and nothing happens. Nothing happened because it's all just fantasy. Violent and disturbing fantasies, of course, but fantasies nevertheless. Befitting his profession... Edward Zoss spoke calmly and confidently in the courtroom setting, but he later admitted the difficulties of such a case. The only way you can defend this case practically was to take on the burden of convincing this jury somehow, really to a certainty, that he could never do this, said Zoss. But then, how do you do that in a case where the guy is admittedly interested in this stuff? Eventually, on New Year's Eve of 2012, Renowned New York forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz interviewed Gilberto in his holding cell. Dietz rose to fame through his assertion that Jeffrey Dahmer was of sound mind when he committed his string of horrifying murders, and it was his job to determine whether Gilberto was willing or capable of acting on his lurid fantasies. Following a lengthy question and answer session, Dietz determined that Gilberto had no desire to actually live out the things he discussed online. Dietz already knew from Volier's NYPD psychology file that the officer had been administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, a standard test meant to identify personality structure and detect signs of psychopathy. The test showed no clinical psychopathology, Dietz said, and that's not something I run into very much. Even the most unassuming of people can display psychopathic traits, which means Officer Vallier is either the most skilled manipulator Dietz has ever encountered, or he truly was of sound mental health. During the interviews, Gilberto openly discussed intimate details of his upbringing with Dr. Dietz and explained the origin of his bizarre and violent fantasies. As a child, he'd been taken to a screening of Jim Carrey's The Mask, the movie itself was amusing enough, but afterwards, Gilberto remembered fixating on an image of Cameron Diaz, who at one point had her wrists bound before being tied to a tree. The Mask would quickly become a younger Gilberto's favorite movie, though he never told anyone why he enjoyed it so much or why he'd play the same scene over and over again. By the end of high school, Gilberto was a frequent visitor of a website known as Mookie's Kitchen, infamous for its depictions of terrified young women being killed, butchered, and then cooked in cruel and creative ways. However, in his real life, Gilberto was never anything but quietly respectful towards women and remained a virgin until he met his wife, Kathleen. In fact, there are no available testimonies of him acting in a violent or threatening manner towards just about anyone. I saw the kinds of things Officer Vallier was saying online, Dr. Dietz said, and there's no denying how disturbing they are. I also understand how the evidence could be construed in that way that suggests that he might act on such fantasies, but I see him as many steps removed from the kind of person that might start to take action. To class someone as a potential offender, 
You need to be more than just whatever sick thoughts are floating around their head, Dietz went on to explain. You need all the aggressive actions and character flaws that indicate they might be, that one in a thousand monster we're all afraid of. But in Officer Valier's case, I couldn't find them. During his trial summations on March 7th of 2013, Gilberto openly wept as he listened to his attorney describe his wife's decision to divorce him. His foolishness on the internet, his insensitive ugly thoughts have cost him everything, one of them said. The conversations are preposterous, they are disturbing, they're disgusting. We should be upset that people are thinking these thoughts, but they do not constitute a criminal offense. In response, the state's prosecutor painted Gilberto as a reckless, impulsive man who was just days away from acting on his perverse urges. There is something incredibly wrong just on the fact that with a New York City police officer talking about killing a high school student and then googling to try to get information about her address, U.S. Attorney Randall Jackson said. That is a man who was trying to move a plan into action. Think about your favorite restaurant, Jackson continued. If you were to find out that the chef at that restaurant had a deep-seated fantasy of poisoning all of the people in the restaurant, and that night after night he was engaging in conversations with other people about how he could poison the restaurant goers, would you continue to eat at that restaurant? Of course you wouldn't. Five days following summations, and after many hours of deliberation, the jury convened for their final court appearance. The foreman appeared visibly exhausted as he stood back up, took a breath, and read the verdict. We find the defendant guilty, he said, on the charge of conspiracy to kidnap. Gilberto shook his head in disbelief as he was led away by bailiffs, and many claimed the verdict was a clear miscarriage of justice. Were the jury even watching the same trials as us, Gilberto's mother asked one journalist, but in the days that followed, a member of the jury publicly defended their decision. We did what we did in good conscience, said Victor Pinero because we believed his fantasy was going to step into reality. In the same way an addict needs a larger and larger dose, he was needing things that were more and more real, he was bringing it into real life. At his sentencing, Gilberto received life in prison for the conspiracy charge and a maximum of five years for accessing the Federal National Crime Information Center database without authorization. Gilberto's mother was horrified and was a central figure in coordinating his eventual appeal, which shocked everyone when it was met with success during June of 2014. A judge from the federal district court announced that Gilberto's conviction was set to be overturned, saying the evidence supported his contention that he was engaged in only fantasy roleplay. And by that time, Gil had already served 21 months in prison, and the lesser conviction regarding unauthorized access to the NYPD database was commuted to time served, and he was released. Since his exoneration, Gil has been incredibly open about his past and present, and authored the book Raw Deal, the untold story of NYPD's cannibal cop. Amazon describes the book as a controversial saga of a man who was in prison for thought crimes and a look into an online world of dark fantasy and violence that most people don't know exists, except maybe in their nightmares. Gilberto Valier might have escaped a jail sentence, but the FBI hadn't finished with the dark fetish network. In January of 2013, they raided the Hamilton, New Jersey home of 22-year-old Mike Van Hees and found evidence of fantasies involving children on his personal computer. Shockingly, his wife defended these fantasies, telling reporters, I was cool with it. It's disturbing, yeah, but you have to accept your partner's flaws in a marriage. No one's perfect. Following his arrest, Mike began cooperating with the FBI and aiding them in the apprehension of two other suspected child abusers, a 65-year-old police chief in Bedford, Massachusetts, and a 61-year-old former high school librarian who in 2009 had faced accusations of inappropriate contact with four male students. The FBI intercepted Mike's communications with the two men, assumed his identity, then made an ambiguous request from the man from Massachusetts. Essentially, the FBI asked him nothing more than to show up at a certain place with stuff for a thing, and when he did, he brought along a taser, a claw hammer, some meat skewers, and a dental instrument used in the removal of human teeth. 
Dale Bollinger, a.k.a. the Moody Blues, was arrested in the UK following a joint operation between British and American police. After a four-day trial at Canterbury Crown Court in July of 2014, Bollinger was found guilty of grooming an underage girl online. He also admitted to several other offenses, including administering a poison or noxious substance following an incident in which he put a cloth soaked in drying cleaning fluid over a female friend's mouth in July of 2010. After giving him a nine-year jail sentence, the presiding judge said his behavior was abhorrent, shocking, and dangerous, while psychiatrists ruled that Bollinger was not suffering from mental illness. None of this is real, he said during an attempt to defend himself. I'm an idiot because I went and put stupid things online, thinking that it was funny. But what's perfectly clear in Bollinger's case is that his posts were intended to be anything but comical. He had already committed a serious predatory offense by the time he came into contact with Gilberto Valle, one that he undoubtedly deserved to be punished for. Whereas in Gilberto's case, he was convicted of a thought crime, not a violent or predatory one. Perhaps Dr. Park Dietz has best summed it up when he said, What troubles me is that the whole world fails to recognize that just because someone has a desire to do something doesn't mean they'll do it. The only problem is, very few people find themselves gripped by violent fantasies, and among those that do, an even smaller percentage spend hours and hours at a time writing about them with strangers on the dark web. Serial killers have been known to spend years at a time preparing for their killing sprees, and much of it includes lurid ideations that are shockingly similar to Gilberto Valle's. So where exactly is the line between ideation and intention? Perhaps it's not Dr. Dietz who said it best, but rather an old folk singer who once sang, And if my thought dreams could be seen, they'd probably put my head in a guillotine. But it's alright, Ma, it's life. And life only. Sometime in 2014, an Australian police officer named Stephen Hegarty was sitting in his office reviewing several pieces of photographic evidence. The process was slow and mentally exhausting because the photographs that Senior Constable Hegarty was reviewing constituted some of the most maddeningly disturbing things he'd ever seen. Each picture showed a child below the age of 10 being abused by someone considerably older, and they weren't simply a handful of photographs, there were thousands of them. Sometimes the abuser was female, most of the time they were male, but all had gone to considerable lengths to obscure their faces, along with any distinguishable tattoos, scars, or marks. At least, so they thought. As Hegarty continued to study the horrifying photographs, he suddenly noticed something small and seemingly insignificant. On one of the abuser's fingers, just below where flesh met fingernail, was a small, dark freckle. The same freckle was present on the finger of almost all the masked abusers depicted in the photographs, leading Hegarty to the realization that they were all the same person, all the same man. The freckle constituted a minuscule detail, but it was one that would become a key piece of physical evidence in a global policing operation designed to combat the exploitation of children. Christened Operation Prism, the operation sought to bring down the single largest child exploitation site on the dark web, whose estimated 45,000 members accessed via sophisticated Tor encryption software. The Australian division of the investigation team, headed by Hegarty and dubbed Task Force Argos, had discovered that the man running the site was actually a fellow Australian and was most likely living in the southernmost area of the country. Yet despite having a rough idea of his location, the man's identity remained a mystery. The only thing police had to go on was the four-letter username he used when communicating on the site, SURF. A few weeks later, South Australian Assistant Police Commissioner Paul Dixon received a call from an officer at Task Force Argos. All they said was, we had a potential target in our jurisdiction, Dixon later said, but at that stage, we didn't know his name, who he was, we didn't even know he existed. All we knew was the username SURF. The global investigation into the website, 
the name of which has been kept a closely guarded secret, went public in 2011, when a German man was arrested on charges of exploiting children. This is how police first learned that the website's owner was operating out of South Australia. Having shifted their attention to the region, police managed to arrest a high-ranked member of the site who was living in Queensland. Police had hoped that the man was the mysterious serf, but to their dismay, he was not. However, the man revealed that Surf was indeed Australian and confirmed that he was operating from the south of the country. Another break in the case came in early 2014, when Dutch police raided the apartment of a suspected child abuser and seized his electronic devices. Then, after analyzing his computer's hard drive, investigators discovered that the man had ready access to the notorious website and demanded he hand over his credentials. Using the man's login details, police managed to access the site, then began analyzing the metadata from a number of different photographs. Almost all of them had been taken by the exact same make and model of camera, a compact variety of Panasonic. Wherever Surf was acquiring his illegal content, more than 90% of it appeared to be coming from the exact same source. Officers from Task Force Argos began trawling the internet for any other mentions of a user named Surf. It took weeks, but they found one. On a forum dedicated to discussion between owners of four-wheel drive vehicles, officers discovered that several posts had been written by a user named Surf. Surf claimed to be an experienced off-roader and appeared highly opinionated regarding the best kinds of tires and suspension to use to ensure a vehicle was truly suitable for all terrains. But what officers noticed almost immediately was the near-identical style of typing. It was undoubtedly the same surf from the infamous unnamed website. They just had to find proof. Two days later, after trawling through thousands of surf posts and comments, police made a breakthrough. Many of the links surf had posted were broken and brought back nothing but 404 pages. But one worked, and that one was all they needed. Officers found themselves staring at a Volkswagen Amarok a crew cab pickup truck produced by VW since 2010. But most importantly, the truck's registration plate was visible, and after plugging it into the national database, a single name came back. Shannon McCool. Following a preliminary background check, police made a truly harrowing discovery. Shannon McCool, one of the biggest purveyors of child exploitation material on the planet, had been working with children and young people through various volunteer programs for the better part of a decade. But what's worse is at the time of the background check, Shannon was a full-time employee of South Australia's Department for Child Protection, meaning he had direct access to dozens of highly vulnerable children. Officers from Task Force Argos leapt into action, gathering as much data and evidence on McCool as possible. If they wanted to guarantee a conviction, they needed as strong a case as possible, but that meant biding their time and allowing McCool to continue operating the site, causing irreparable harm to an untold number of innocent children. As the investigation progressed, police made yet another disturbing discovery. During the summer of 2013, an anonymous tipster contacted Shannon's employer, the Department for Child Protection, claiming he'd made an inappropriate comment regarding one of the children in his case. Shannon was suspended for three months pending an official investigation, but incredibly, was permitted to return to work following vehement denials and a general lack of evidence. Investigating police officers were understandably nauseated by these new details, and it was clear that McCool posed a clear and present threat to the safety of children everywhere. But it was also through their careful analysis of McCool and his likeness that they made their biggest breakthrough yet. One of the officers from Task Force Argos had been given a very unusual task. He was charged with identifying which of McCool's social media photos showed his hands in any kind of detail. Since the abusers present in the photographic evidence went to great lengths to conceal their faces, the only thing that truly set them apart were their hands, or more specifically, their fingers. This meant the officer in question spent hours upon hours cropping images of McCool's hands, along with the appendages of many others suspected in the trafficking or exploitation of children. These images were then painstakingly digitally enhanced until ready to be used as possible identifiers for the abusers in the photographs. Then one day, Senior Constable Stephen Hegarty 
came to visit the officer at his station to see how he was progressing. The officer was in the process of enhancing images of McCool's hands, and as Hegarty reviewed them, his jaw quietly dropped. On Shanna's middle finger, just below where flesh met fingernail, was a small, dark freckle. It was him, the man from the photographs. It was Shannon. He wasn't just one of the largest purveyors of child exploitation material on the face of the earth. He was directly involved in its creation, all whilst having direct access to some of the most vulnerable young people in Australia. As we've already mentioned, the decision was made not to apprehend Shannon immediately. Police wished to covertly collate evidence on Shannon without alerting him to the investigation, as doing so might give him a chance to warn others or destroy key evidence. But after it was discovered that he was not only an employee of South Australia's Department of Child Protection, but was active in the sickening exploitation of children, police realized that they had no choice but to arrest him as soon as possible. Yet to do so successfully, without Shannon destroying any evidence, police had to plan a delicate but decisive operation. There are certain programs and techniques a person can use to render their devices completely useless to us, one officer explained. It doesn't matter who you are, you're not getting in, and if that had happened in our case, there's no way we'd have obtained the same kind of result we achieved. Our timing and subtlety were beyond crucial to the overall success of this operation. Finally, on the evening of June 10th, 2014, Shannon McCool was sitting at home, presumably overseeing his evil empire, when he heard a gentle knocking on his front door. He got up from his chair, neglecting to close his laptop, then walked to the front door to see who was knocking. From the sound of the knock, it could have been a neighbor, a cold caller, maybe even a friend or a relative. But when he opened the door and found no one to be seen, he stepped outside to take a look around. The moment his shoe touched the concrete, Senior Constable Hegarty ambushed him, shoved him up against a wall before forcibly sitting him down. McCool was then informed that he was under arrest and reminded of his right to remain silent, but he didn't say a thing. Hegarty later said that McCool appeared shell-shocked, almost as if he hadn't expected any kind of legal repercussions whatsoever. Yet as law enforcement's reasons for raiding his address became obvious, McCool turned pale, then stared into space as if drifting off into catatonia. He was finished. Life as he knew it was about to change forever. Within minutes of McCool's apprehension, officers from a vast array of Australian policing agencies were swarming around his apartment. Senior Constable Hegarty had been the first into the lounge. There, on a small brown coffee table, sat McCool's Toshiba laptop, still connected to an external hard drive that no doubt contained a trove of sickening material. Hegarty found that McCool was running a sophisticated variety of encryption software, but it was one that cybercrime detectives were quite easily able to bypass, and once they did, it was simply a case of clicking a few links before officers gained full access to one of the largest caches of child exploitation material ever uncovered. Police even recovered the same Panasonic digital camera used to produce the vast majority of McCool's collection, meaning the case against him would be even easier to prosecute. It took Task Force Argos almost two weeks to identify just seven victims from the thousands upon thousands of obscene photographs. It was a slow, painstaking process, and much of it involved contacting the children's charities that McCool had been involved in. Most kept detailed files on the children that had been in their care, and after hundreds were delivered to their offices, Constable Hegarty and Task Force Argos set about physically comparing the children with those found in McCool's content. Seven of them were physically identical to those in the Department of Child Protection's files. I was satisfied that there were seven victims, Constable Hegarty later said. We examined everything, cross-referenced times and dates the children were under his care. It all matched. The worst thing is, we don't even know if that was all of them. There could have been more. We can never be 100% sure. Another piece of evidence Task Force Argos had to fall back on was an exact handwriting match between McCool's and certain pieces of writing displayed in the photographs. It's common practice among those who manufacture these indecent images of children to create so-called proof pictures. Creators use several different techniques, but one involves a handwritten message from the abuser, 
detailing the date, time, or their username. This was the technique McCool used, and it provided evidence that Task Force Argos were only too happy to add to their already burgeoning arsenal. I think I identified 14 photographs where he had handwritten something on a post-it or a piece of paper, Constable Hegarty explained. He would actually place these notes on the child just prior to or during the abuse taking place. From examples of handwriting taken from his house, we managed to compare it to that in the images. Again, it was a dead match. Once McCool realized just how much evidence was stacked against him, he offered his complete cooperation with the ongoing investigation. Hegarty accepted the offer, but it wasn't a confession he was interested in. Task Force Argos had more than enough to put him away for life, so the one thing McCool had to offer them were the identities of the remaining children he was documented as abusing. He agreed to interview with Constable Hegarty, with the several other officers gathered in the adjacent room. A lengthy question and answer session commenced. The priority was identifying the remaining kids, Hegarty said, and at that stage, I was confident that we were going to get the right result. He told us four names, then claimed that he couldn't remember any of the others, of which there were dozens. McCool also answered questions regarding the dark web hell trove that he owned and operated, and although he tried to minimize his involvement in the actual abuse, some of his responses shook even veteran officers to their core. When asked how involved he was with the day-to-day -day running of the website, McCool stunned those in attendance by explaining the sense of pride his sickening collection gave him. It was bizarre, one of the witnesses explained. After the first interview, we just sat in the car park for a while, unable to speak. I think we were just a bit blown away by the magnitude of what McCool had said. After two more hour-long interviews, Hegarty realized just how manipulative and malevolently intelligent McCool really was. His methods were shrewd to say the least, he explained. I think this is one reason why his victim range was so young. As soon as he thought a child would be capable of reporting anything, he would shy away from them. He would be very selective of who he targeted as victims. Constable Hegarty had no doubts that McCool would have continued abusing children if he hadn't been apprehended. He was waiting for his next opportunity, that's my honest belief. It might have taken another six months, it might have taken another two years, but given the opportunity, he would have offended again. Following his sentencing hearing on August 7th of 2015, McCool was sentenced to 35 years in prison, with a non-parole period of 28 years. However, in April of 2018, his 35-year sentence was reportedly reduced by two to three years after he assisted in the identification and capture of a prolific Danish criminal. After learning of the sentence reduction, the father of one of McCool's victims spoke to a journalist from Australia's ABC News. I don't like that he is getting a re-sentence because he has got no remorse at all, the man said. He didn't even say thank you. He was sitting there with a smug smile on his face the whole time. I suggest to McCool and any other person who has ever hurt a child to stand up and start thinking about the children and stop thinking about themselves. These children are living with a lifetime of hurt, while their abusers get three meals a day and a roof over their head. Usually, prisoners who help police capture their fellow criminals are greatly rewarded for their efforts. The presiding judge could have given Shannon McCool a much greater discount on his sentence. Instead, he defended his decision to grant just two to three years. Your cooperation has not been complete, particularly relating to a serious matter in this jurisdiction, he said. That does not reduce your discount, but shows that there are matters that you still keep secret. Your contrition and remorse remain equivocal and uncertain. Perhaps, in this case, the judge is on to something. Shannon McCool has since claimed to be repentant of his actions, and has professed a desire to continue his cooperation with the authorities. But on likelihood, his motivations amount to little more than a desire for self-preservation. Perhaps the best insight into how Shannon truly feels regarding his crimes against humanity is a five-word comment that he left on his website's message board. The comment reads, Abusing children should be acceptable. In late August of 2015, a spine-chilling rumor began circulating around the internet. 
among the deepest reaches of fringe forums such as 4chan, as well as certain sections of more mainstream sites such as Reddit, Facebook, and Twitter, a mysterious group of self-declared militants claim to have captured several Islamic State fighters. Not only that, but they announced their intentions to beat, torture, and then murder them, all via a dark web live streaming site. On a monochrome, hastily constructed website, the group posted a chilling statement of intent. We are working around the clock. We're operating in a war zone and got more urgent things to worry about, but we will deliver and we will hit the deadline. Expect fun games and torture as promised, all interactive and completely free of charge. We will make at least the first hour family friendly, the statement continued, and explicitly warn you before things get violent, but we won't stop under any circumstances. Torture must become death. Red rooms are a hard business and few can stomach it. It also means a lot of attention and extra hassle for us, but we promise one thing, we will make them movie stars. The rumors spread like wildfire and before long, secondary sources of information such as the subreddits r slash darkweb and r slash tor began counting down the hours until the murderous stream was set to commence. The subscriber numbers of both subreddits ballooned, yet most users weren't there out of any real thirst for blood. They were simply curious. They wanted undeniable, irrefutable proof that the darkest legends of the deep web were actually true. At its core, the dark web, or deep web as it's sometimes referred to, is in reality a relatively small collection of websites that are unsearchable and almost untraceable. As you can imagine, this makes the dark web an attractive concept to those interested in illicit marketplaces, but according to some, the anonymity that Tor browsers and Onion routers bring has drawn in a very different kind of predator. There are rumors of videotaped gladiatorial fights to the death, or deranged World War II era experiments being replicated for the benefit of paying observers. Others promise to turn a grown adult woman into a so-called living doll whereby she is encased in a restrictive latex suit before being subjected to horrendous methods of physical torture. But of all the pervasive legends spawned by the dark web, the so-called Red Rooms are perhaps the most disturbing of all. Legend has it that somewhere among the deepest reaches of the dark web, people are broadcasting live and fully interactive executions of innocent, often hand-picked individuals. But do these Red Rooms actually exist? It's a tediously common question, said Eileen Ormsby, an Australian journalist who spent years studying the dark web and all of its related phenomena. How can I go deeper in the deep web? Where's the really dark stuff? Well, the answer is pretty simple. That darker side that people talk of, it simply doesn't exist. Eileen is quick to point out that in some cases, crimes against humanity have indeed been broadcast live on the dark web, but not the kind associated with red rooms. It's been said that notorious Australian child abuser Peter Scully first broadcast the infamous Daisy's Destruction live on the dark web to a select audience of paying customers, and only later uploaded it behind a paywall amounting to $10,000. But in terms of actual red rooms existing for the purpose of live executions, Eileen Ormsby says the idea is ludicrous. The FBI has dealt with dark web cases relating to child exploitation, kidnapping, narcotics trafficking, and even contract killing. But as Eileen argues, if they're real, why haven't Red Rooms found their way onto the list? And if Red Rooms truly are real, how has not a single, confirmable screenshot made its way onto the surface web? It's worth noting that around the early 2010s, which is round about the same time that the first rumors of Red Rooms began to circulate, the internet witnessed the meteoric rise of a novel form of short horror story. Named in parody of another popular online trend known as copypasta, creepypastas followed a very similar concept. However, instead of whimsical or thought-provoking paragraphs, users copied and pasted short-form horror stories onto each other's pages and profiles instead. The likes of Jeff the Killer, Candle Cove, Smile Dog, and the now notorious Slender Man were being circulated around almost every single forum and social media site on the internet, with the latter being so popular that it spawned several spin-offs, including movies, documentaries, and video games. In response to the demand for such content, 
Reddit users created a forum known as No Sleep, with its sole purpose being to collate the ever-mounting numbers of creepypastas being churned out by amateur writers. But as the collection of short, sometimes ambiguous short horror stories began to swell, a decidingly bizarre phenomenon began to emerge. It began when one No Sleep subscriber posed the innocent question of, is this story real? The vast majority of respondents gave the perfectly logical answer of, probably not, this reads like a fictional story. Other users asserted the contrary, that the story could quite easily be real, but once it had been established that No Sleep was indeed a creative writing forum, interest in what was posted there dropped off dramatically. However, instead of allowing interest to die off organically, the forum's moderators took the incredible step of removing any posts or comments that made any reference to fiction, creative writing, or even the word story itself. One might expect such rampant interference to be poison for a place built on free expression, but instead, something incredible happened. The forum's subscribership ballooned to 1 million, then 5, then 10 million, and to date, no Sleep subscriber numbers stand at over 17 million individual users. Visitors and contributors alike found they actually appreciated the moderator's efforts to curate an online space where the lies and truth were indistinguishably blurred. No Sleep is so popular because its users enjoy actively suspending their disbelief. It thrills them to think that such fantastical stories might be true. In fact, many actively wish that they were just in the same way that those who propagate rumors of red rooms are overtly or covertly thrilled that they might just exist somewhere, down in the darkest recesses of the dark web. Interestingly, a British hacker nicknamed Cthulhu has claimed that he's come across several different red rooms while going across the dark web. But rather than the macabre spectacle they advertised themselves to be, Cthulhu explained that they were nothing but scams. I decided to take a look at their servers, he said, just to see where they were located, but found they had less security than your average company-issue laptop. I thought it was strange that such an illicit network didn't seem to have any major security concerns, so I carried on digging, and shortly afterwards I determined it was a scam. Users would be charged exorbitant amounts of money to gain access to the Red Room, and once they did, they were greeted by an ominous-looking countdown clock which informed them of when the show would be starting. But then, when the timer ran out, the page began to load, then was nothing. Maybe an error message, maybe a blank screen, but certainly not any kind of live execution or snuff film. Remember the ISIS Red Room we discussed at the beginning of this? Well, exactly the same thing happened there. The trolls who put the site together had promised that a variety of grisly punishments would be inflicted on their terrorist captors, but when the feed went live, 21 minutes of nothing ended with a suspiciously clean and well-groomed prisoner being force-fed cooked bacon. They promised a snuff film. Instead, they fed a guy lunch. The site was later replaced by a notice stating it had been seized as part of a joint law enforcement operation. The notice appeared to be made by an amateur. A similar website popped up just days later, but once again, it proved to be a complete farce. The lack of solid evidence of Red Rooms has led some to believe that they're nothing but an urban legend. However, during the summer of 2020, two 17-year-old Italian boys were arrested on suspicion of having paid entry to an online execution room. After 10 months, the investigation by the Carabinieri of Siena with the cooperation of the Prosecutor of Minors of Florence, claimed the website the boys had attempted to access was called The Hell of Horrors, and contained thousands of rooms, chats, blogs, and shop windows containing every kind of abomination conceivable. The boys were apparently released without charge, but their arrest shows that at least some government agencies are taking the threat of red rooms very seriously. But in all honesty, that should come as no surprise. At this point... The concept of Red Rooms has existed for more than a hundred years. Back in 1894, H.G. Wells released a short story with the same title, one which tells the tale of a haunted bedroom within an old Gothic castle. The term Red Room was also used to describe an area of the haunted house in the 1977 book The Amityville Horror, and was used as a term to describe the protagonist's BDSM room in the novel Fifty Shades of Grey. Then, in 1999, Japanese film director Daisuke Yamanuchi 
released his seminal horror classic also named Red Room. This incarnation was much more in line with the contemporary idea of Red Rooms and involved prisoners who are forced to pick cards to decide which kind of torture will be inflicted, who will apply it, and who will be the next victim. The chosen tortures start off relatively mild, but gradually escalate into extreme sadism and abuse. As you can see, Red Rooms are not a new concept, and by the time they became an internet legend, the term had been a byword for places in which acts of evil occur for more than a century. But perhaps the truly frightening thing about Red Rooms is that they might actually be real, and it's that we can't seem to discern what actually occurs on the dark web and what doesn't. Some sections of society have cultivated online spaces that are so far removed from reality that truth itself has become a fluid concept. If we all believe that Red Rooms exist, then by some philosophical standards they do exist, albeit in a rather abstract manner. Red Rooms have well and truly entered the collective consciousness and humanity's very history as a tale of dragging the imaginary into reality. That means it might only be a matter of time before someone takes such a frightening but mythical concept and turns it into a terrifying reality. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for members. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, new episodes every Tuesday at noon, and you can listen anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, me and Pete Davidson are dating.